Solid rock. <laughs> Are y'all happy to be in that in the upper room this evening? <laughs> Have you told them what y'all gonna talk about tonight? Because I'm looking at your notes and I'm like, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, not yet. Ah, I know what it is. No, I won't. That's why I asked first. My I'm like, I'm not gonna say. If you have a hymn book, find Psalm 408, but you may not need it. This is, I've got peace like a river. Me and Amarissa sing this in the car sometimes. <laughs> and it gives us a verse with this, 408, from Isaiah 48, verse 18. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. So if you know it, sing it with me. And we'll try to find a good key that won't scratch the ceiling. If it does, too late. Here we go. Yeah. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. Too. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean in my soul. Last verse. I've got joy like a fountain. Joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. And if you know the Lord, you have all those things. Amen. Even if you don't feel it right now, it's there. Don't worry, it's there. You may be seated, church. Thank you for singing with me. Do we have any announcements to share before we move on with the service? Anything at all? Yes, ma'am. Well, you know, the Bible says to make a joyful noise, but I was watching some of y'all, and some of y'all got about as much rhythm as Steve Martin did in that movie, where y'all are... The jerk. Yeah. <laughs> but that's all right. The Lord appreciates it anyway. Thanks to many of us. We're going to be looking in Philippians chapter 3 uh, for a little bit tonight. And I'm going to talk about something that is rarely ever discussed, and that is our identity. Philippians chapter 3. Now, here's a question, and if you want to speak up and answer it, it's fine. When you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? Veterinarian. Veterinarian. Doctor. A doctor. All right. <laughs> a, a, a helicopter and uh, an uh, airplane pilot, pilot. And, and a photographer. All right. Well, that's pretty good. I wanted to be a child psychologist. A nurse. A nurse. Police officer. Police officer. I want to be a rock star. A rock star. All right. Scientist. Scientist. A mad one or a regular one? Regular. Okay. Pro baseball player. Pro baseball player. Uh, there's things like firemen, police. Uh, Bill Maher made the statement, uh, believe it or not, he, he used to be ultra-liberal, and he's acting, acting like he's got some sense lately. He said that uh, if an uh, a average child got to be what they wanted, the world would be full of cowboys and Indians right now. And he said, I wanted to be a pirate, but I thank God that my parents didn't take me to the hospital and remove one of my eyes and prepare me for peg leg surgery. <laughs> and what he was talking about was, well, we'll get into that in a minute. So any particular reason why you wanted to be what you wanted to be? Okay. Because you'd love to help animals. Following my father, brother, and uncle. Oh, goodness. Okay. Yeah, that's a good reason. Yeah. 
Yeah, my, my grandmother, um, she was dealing with um, a lot of mental illness at some point, and um, I wanted to kind of cure for it. So with that, you know, all the animals that I had, I want to be able to fix those up and up, you know. But it's very noble. Yeah. I would be a police officer because I watched that on 12 on TV. Out of 12. As a matter of fact, I watched that yesterday <laughs> for a while. My father took me and my brother to see the Washington Saturday to play. And Mickey Mantle walked out. Mickey Mantle. And I was hooked. You were hooked. I can understand that. Well, now, has anybody in here got enough nerve to admit to who you imitated as a child? I imitated. I mean, a, uh, whatever the person is that hangs upside down and does the... Acrobat. Yeah, I imitated that as a child on the swing today. All right. Very good. A lot of people do that. Bonzi. Bonzi, yeah. <laughs> Have you seen him lately? Advertising reverse mortgage and he's about 80 years old. My, how the mighty have fallen, you know? Yeah, I, um, as a matter of fact, um, I got the chance to do something that... I actually asked a couple of baseball historians if they had ever heard of anybody doing this. And one of them told me, he said, in the millions of games that have been played, he said, what you did is promptly unique. They said, I've never heard of it before. And what I did was I threw out three guys that have played the same inning from center field. Wow, very good. All right. Now, uh, some of you have already expressed that, but who were your role models necessarily? Now, you mentioned Mickey Mantle, definitely. That's a good one. That's a good role model. I didn't have one. Okay. My mom. Your mom. John Wayne. John Wayne. That's what was in this kid, you know, the FBI. FBI. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. So my nanny, my family had already passed away, but I don't know I was two. Okay. I'll have to admit that Clint Eastwood was one of mine. I've always wanted to point that great big gun and go, let her go, punk. You know, but anyway, never got a chance to do that. Not that you know of. Okay. Or say, I got one bullet or two. Yeah, that's right. How many did I fire? Was it five or was it six? Debbie. Oh. Barbie. Barbie. All right. Barbie. Okay. Not the woke one, I hope. <laughs> there was no such thing as woke back then, was it? Aurora Brown. Aurora Brown. Okay. Anybody else before we move on? I mean, um, I think that the people that I died. Okay. Like, you and Well, that's very kind. Yes. The old style role model represented, when we were growing up, most of us, they represented decent society, heroes for the good, and people who were brave and tough or kind and even beautiful. They were role models. And believe it or not, Quite often, parents were more than not our role models. A lot of us, if we were, we had good parents, and if we were raised by great parents and all that, a lot of times they were our role models. We looked up to them and wanted to be like them. But you know, nowadays we don't really have the same kind of role models anymore. And the, one of the biggest problems, and nobody really wants to hear this, but is that parents today, a lot of them are either too busy, too selfish, or even corrupt sometimes to be the role models that their children look for. And that's why we see a lot of awful stuff going on because they're perpetuating what they saw the parents do. And so now we have celebrities that push things 
that celebrities wouldn't have dared years ago on the children like the transgenderism and that's what Bill Maher was talking about and are now the role models for children and their and and we can't blame the kids that for that because that's what they see and they think that well maybe that's cool because that's a celebrity that's doing that and so as a result it has increased several hundred percent that type of movement amongst young people now Parents, you've got to safeguard your child as they are searching for identity because right now every single young person is in a search for identity and sometimes that goes all the way up to nearly 30, 40 years old sometimes. It does. Now there are people that have been adults for years that are still searching for their identity but they're not as impressionable as the young people. To where they're not going to do something really outrageous to find their identity but you see you look around and you see how sometimes people will dress in some of the most outrageous ways and you'll see them post it on facebook and you go oh i wouldn't i wouldn't take a picture of that you know but they the reason they do it is they are searching for identity and so we really shouldn't look down our nose at them because we should help them, but they are searching and they're trying this and they're trying that and, and every kind of thing to find where they fit. And so we've got to safeguard the young people as they're searching for identity and every one of them will and give them the right influence until they find their place in Christ and it may be a long time but they will now when maybe did you find yourself now don't be like junior samples off of hee haw he said well I just looked in the mirror and there I was okay so that's not finding yourself maybe somebody would like to briefly say at what point in your life did you find yourself and I believe that I see that in you is there anyone else? Yes. I graduated boot camp. Graduated boot camp. You had been made all over again. That's true. When I had my child. When you had your child. I still haven't found myself. I still don't feel. All right. And that's okay to be honest about that because sometimes that takes a lifetime of searching. When, at what point did we find ourselves? Now, this is age old this is not something new the bible says is nothing new under the sun and paul writes about it in philippians chapter 3 let's look at that and maybe this will help he said finally my brethren rejoice in the lord to write the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous but for you it is safe then he makes a sarcastic remark even though it's in the old English. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. The word dog was often used by the Jews to describe a Gentile. Paul is using it to describe a Jew here. And he's talking about the legalistic Jews that demand that you practice the uh, age old ritual of circumcision uh, in order to be saved and that's what they were teaching and he, he was referring to anybody that would do that uh, as a dog and the word concision literally means mutilation what he's saying here is beware of the legalist listen carefully because young people searching for uh, their identity get this thrown at them as well beware of the legalists that try to destroy your freedom in Christ and try to teach you a work salvation this discourages a young person from ever coming to Christ and it discourages older people as well when they feel like they're not measuring up they're not working hard enough for their salvation when it ain't got a thing to do with works to start with but there are people that will bring that into play so that's one of the first warnings. Uh, don't let a person that is trying to find their identity in Christ be 
uh, confronted by the legalists because it will never be enough. They will, and and they're kind of right. You could never work your way hard enough to get to heaven, no matter what. If anybody thinks that they have to work their way to heaven, they will go to hell tired. And but there are people that will tell you that, and a lot of young people will not identify with Christians or with Christ because that's what they have heard. That's one of the big ones. And then Paul says, for we are the circumcision, and he's speaking it from a spiritual sense, which worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. How many times have you heard a motivational speaker say, the power is within you? Well, that's a lie. It ain't. Not you. It's not you. It might be the Holy Spirit, but it ain't you. Or believe in yourself. That has been that that that's an old psychological ploy. But what if you believe in yourself? You're going to get let down. You're always going to get let down if you believe in yourself. Because why? We are flawed human beings with problems. And if you're believing in that, you're going to get disappointed. That's kind of like the man who is his own lawyer has a fool for a client. You know, it's dangerous and foolish to say things like that. And, and in Paul's day, many people thought the same thing. So Paul addressed the people who were bragging on the flesh. There are a lot of people who think they've accomplished this and they've done this and they've done that and they're bragging on that. Paul said to these people, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinks he have where he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. He said, You think you're something? He said, Let me tell you about myself. And Paul was not bragging, he was making a point. Circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, he's batting the thousand here concerning zeal persecuting the church touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless I'm going to explain what he's saying here but what a pedigree Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel who was one of the greatest of Hebrew scholars and teachers in history Paul was one of the most educated men of his time there was Probably no one more educated than Paul at the time. I always say he was the, um, what is that? Uh, James, yeah, D. James Kennedy uh, of, the, the, of the ancient times. If you ever seen Dr. Kennedy when he was alive, when his program Coral Ridge Hour would go off, it listed all of his degrees. It looked like a receipt from CBS. <laughs> Y'all ever gotten one of them before? And he, he was, Dr. Kennedy was one of the most brilliant men. And he was a Presbyterian on top of that one of the most educated men in Christianity. And he didn't sound like a Presbyterian. He sounded more like an evangelical Baptist when he was preaching. But anyway, Paul was extremely educated. He was a member of the Sanhedrin court. He had power and authority as a very high-ranking Pharisee. And you know, today we push our kids we push our young people into every school, into every opportunity. You've got to go to college. You've got to do this. You've got to achieve this. And we push and push and push to the point that we see parents even neglect the house of God today so their kids can excel in sports. And what a shame. But after Paul found his identity, and he was a grown man, and he ran smack into Jesus on the road to Damascus. That's the only time he found his identity. Even with all the rank and the education and all the stuff he had, Paul was a grown man and a teacher among teachers. He still had not found his identity. Look at what he said. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. All of that stuff amounted to nothing after finding Christ. When I first started out in the ministry in the 80s, 
I was at a church in Rustburg one night, and I was an assistant to the pastor. I kind of, I was his bodyguard, his chauffeur. Uh, my job was to be at the altar when someone came forward to pray with him and whatever he needed me to do. I helped him run his radio ministry and all that type of thing. Well, this very distinguished looking gentleman in a very nice suit came to the altar one night on a Sunday night. He needed, for, he needed prayer. And I got down there beside him. I said, Brother, what's on your mind? What can I pray for you about? He said, I'm not sure if I'm saved or not. And I said, well, let's take care of that right now. And I got the Bible out and I talked to him and we prayed together. And he said, well, that is a relief that I'm sure of that now. Now I need to know, this guy was like 50. How do I find God's will for my life? I got asked a lot of stuff at the altars when I worked there at one time. And man, they come up with some tough questions. So I just stayed up there at the altar and shared some stuff out of the Bible with him. And I said, by the way, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm a professor at Liberty University. I had to get, like that cartoon, I had to get my jaw up off the floor, you know. And But that goes to show, you don't ever know who you're going to be talking to that's looking for their identity. And I pray this man found it that night. I believe he did. But what Paul did was when he looked back at all those accomplishments, they meant absolutely nothing to him anymore. Now that he had found his place in Christ. In fact, he states this, not only for himself, but for all of us. That everything has to go out of your life that you count as a fleshly achievement in order to win the goal of a follower of Christ. Whatever you can brag on has to go, unless it's bragging on him. He said this, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Paul lost it all when he decided to follow Christ and I do count them but dung that I may win Christ he had fame he had fortune he had glory and the admiration of men he had power he had prestige and he lost all of that for his new identity in Christ Jesus stated that there was not a greater prophet on the earth than John the Baptist John the Baptist all he could say was that he must increase, but I must decrease. That's an interesting thing to say. And then he makes a statement right here. And be found in him. Not have, talking about Jesus. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And he had just got through saying, if y'all want to brag, he said, I'm blameless as far as the Mosaic law was concerned. All 611 of them, he kept the law. He said, you can't find anything that I've done wrong, but none of that matters anymore that I found Christ. He had all of those things. And so when... God the Father looks upon you. Here's a question. What will he see? Will he see that you had money? I find out you do and you've been hiding it. We're going to have a little talk. I'm just playing. Was he going to see that you had money, that you had looks, that you had fame, that you had power, that you had life experiences, the glory of man? Or will he look at you, even though the world thinks you're something great, will he look at you and see you standing behind the cross? That's the bottom line with that. So when you do finally find your identity, everything will change. Everything will change. And he made this, no, and no longer will you seek any kind of riches, honor, fame, admiration of men. All you will seek, and this is how you find your identity, 
is you seek to know Jesus intimately a little more every day like Nick is talking about get in the word read and pray every day and you will know him not only for the mountains but you'll know him through the valleys Paul made this statement that I may know him and that means to know him intimately to walk with him to, to, to be close to him have total knowledge and the power of his resurrection and not only the power of his resurrection but the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death in other words the life that you are seeking now the life that you may be living has to die in order to really get to, to know Jesus the way you should. You die to yourself and you live for him. Everything that we do should be done for him and for his glory. And when you start to do that, you're, you will start to see your identity in Christ. Any other identity that we have is fleeting. It doesn't last. I think of people that I went to school with. I was at a funeral the other day. And this man had had two beautiful daughters that I went to school with. And I was telling Donna, I said, oh, I know his daughters. Maybe, you know, I'm going to see if I can spot them when they come in here to the funeral. Well, they won't go at just no more. <laughs> That's kind. Ain't none of us gorgeous no more from high school. <laughs> and you know, that that is fleeting. Money is fleeting. It has wings on it. Most everybody in here knows that. Our health, our looks, our admiration of men, whatever. All of that is fleeting. All of those things can be gone in a second. But if you have your identity in Christ, it won't matter if you're old, fat, and ugly like I am. It won't make no difference then. Because that's not where you identify yourself as what you look like or what you got or even what you do. Your identity is in Christ. That's the whole bottom line. That can help you feel young when you're an old man. And knowing that what you, that how you identify yourself is a child of God and a servant of God. And a lot of y'all have already seen how he has sustained you through the craziest times because your identity is not in yourself, but it's in him. And he will keep you on your feet until it's time for you to go home. And so let's be sure that when the young people are looking for their identity, that we show them what we have found and that it is in Christ.